dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to be here in Alexandria at the meeting of the Christian <coughs> Society of Nuclear Medicine. And I'm going to talk about planning and the symmetry considerations for Y90 third therapy. I'm going to talk a little bit about the original background of radio immunization, the principles, the prerequisites patients have to met to be suitable for this kind of therapy, about the necessary examinations which we have to perform to be sure that the patient is suitable, and about finally the symmetry and therapy planning of radiation. I think as you know, this kind of therapy is a transarterial embolization via the hepatic artery with radioactive microspheres, which will embolize within the tumor vessels and we achieve a highly selective tumor uptake because the tumor, the liver metastases, have a different kind of blood supply than the liver parenchyma. Um, the metastases are supplied mainly by arterial vessels in contrast to the, to the liver parenchyma, which is, which is supplied mainly by the portal venous supply. And due to this different supply, we achieve this high tumor uptake by sparing um, the normal liver parenchyma. We use Y90, which is well known in nuclear medicine for example for radioimmunotherapy of lymphomas and um, other treatment of ankles. Um, Y90 is a pure beta emitter with, a, with high energy electrons, 2.28 uh, mega electron volts. And this high energy is resulting in a high range in, in human tissue, which is in mean mainly uh, almost 4 centimeters and the maximum of 11 millimeters. The half of time is almost three days. And the resin particles um, used for cisphere are small particles with no toxicity itself. Um, and one vial, one vial consists of 40 to 60 billion spheres with 50, with 50 becquerels of Y90 in each sphere. I want to go a little bit deeper into the tumor vascularization. You have here the tumor and here the feeding artery. And as the tumor is uh, uh, fast growing, he needs to, to enhance his blood supply. And via different chemokines like vascular and material growth factor, he's making the, the arteries to grow into the tumor. But this is no, not a normal um, blood architecture like in organs, but it's a kind of chaotic. Um, vasculature and these spheres are in that size they embolize in the small artery vessels within the tumor especially within the the, um, the rim of the tumor and that this is true um, is shown by this micro dissymmetry of Kennedy et al from explanted livers which were uh, prior treated with radio mobilization and you can see this this the tumor with a small capsula and these small dots, the black dots are each sphere spheres. And they performed a microsymmetry and you can see on the red uh, lines, these are isocontours of 1000 gray. The green lines is an isocontour of 300 gray. And you can see that the whole tumor is surrounded by this blue line, which means that the whole tumor, uh, that we achieved a, a dose of more than 100 gray in the whole tumor. So for the prerequisites, of course, the patient has to be in a palliative situation, so no curative resection is reasonable in this tumor. However, you have to keep in mind that radiobilization has the potential to stage tumors down, possibly to a resectable stage. And you've got to have failure of first chemotherapy, but which is strongly dependent on the kind of tumor you, you want to treat. And the situation in Germany is, I think, much different to the situation here in Egypt because most patients referred to our department for radiomobilization are suffering from colorectal liver metastases. And this is a little bit different as far as I know, most patients here in Egypt are suffering from hepatocellular carcinomas. And hepatocellular carcinomas radiomobilization is much prior in the therapeutic algorithm as in other kinds of tumors because in HCCs you do not have systemic chemotherapy option are reliable. So we will treat these patients much earlier with radiomobilization than of, for example, colorectal 
liver metastases which have to fail the first and second line chemotherapy before they are referred to, to radiolization. And generally we have as well many neuroendocrine liver metastases, many breast cancer liver metastases and cellular carcinomas and some rare tumors like uvel melanoma metastases <coughs> and also gastric cancer metastases. So not only HCCs are are suitable for treatment for radiomobilization, but almost every uh, liver metastasis arises from any tumor. There's also not only the liver, then not only the tumor is irradiated, but also we are also harming the, the normal, the healthy liver parenchyma. We have to ensure a preserved liver function for these patients. That means that bilirubin should not be too much elevated. We, uh, I would prefer a threshold of uh, bilirubin below 2.0 milligram per deciliter. The liver enzymes should be not too high, and the liver function should be preserved. That means that albumin as a mark of liver synthesis should not be too low. The blood clotting should be within regular limits, and there should be no evidence of ascites as sign of liver failure. There are some other prerequisites. Um, a patent portal way. I have it in brackets because in former days we had to ensure that the portal way is patent, but the new recent studies have shown that we can treat patients even with the occluded portal way um, on a quite safe basis. The liver disease should be predominant, that means that most of the tumor should be within the liver because we are only treating the liver. The patient should be in a quite good shape. For example, the Panofsky index should be below uh, above 70, or the ECOG status should be 1 or 0. The life expectancy of the patient should be above 3 months. Of course, the patient must not be pregnant, and there must not be performed any previous radiation therapy to the liver. To ensure all of these um, prerequisites, we are performing some examinations um, in our, in my department, we are performing a FDG PET CT in all patients. Um, also an MRI may be useful to quantify the tumor burden of the liver, the percentage liver involvement. Um, we use the FDG PET CT to simply exclude relevant X-ray hepatic metastases. And of course, it offers the opportunity to analyze the portal wing. We have to take some lead values into consideration, as I told you, liver enzymes, liver function, blood clotting, kidney parameters, blood count. <coughs> and of course, we have to perform an angiography to get an idea of the anatomy of the hepatic vessel, to analyze the tumor vascularization, and to be sure that the therapy, the radio mobilization, um, can be performed on a technical uh, basis. That means that we can place the catheter um, on this place, we want to treat the tumor um, with sparing as much liver parenchyma as possible. And the same, in the, during the angiography, we are um, performing a technetium MA scintigraphy as well. Um, we know technetium MAA from lung perfusion scintigraphy. And we need this to quantify uh, the liver lung shunting fraction. That means what proportion of MAA which I checked in the hepatic artery um, will go into the to lung via um, arterial venous shunts. And we have to exclude that there is any extra hepatic up uptake of technetium MAA, um, best using SPECT or SPECT CT, because in this case we, we have the risk um, of severe side effects. But I will go on this later on. First, I would like to share some examples from FDG PET CT. This is a um, female with hepatic metastasis arising from a uveal melanoma. Um, quite a common situation as uveal melanoma, if they metastasize, they predominantly metastasize into the liver. You can see on one look that there are several metabolic active metastases within the liver, central necrotic, mainly on the right lobe, but also some small metastases on the left lobe. On the other way, we have here a male with hepatic metastases from a colorectal cancer. And of course, we see some metabolic active metastases within the liver, some small metastases affecting both lobes. 
But we also see that this patient is suffering from relevant X-ray hepatic metastases. For example, in this um, lymph node metastases, the mediastinum are quite uncommon uh, side for metastases of colorectal cancer. And also this patient has some mesenteric deposits uh, metabolically active indicating uh, the presence of peritoneal carcinosis. And I think it is clear that this patient is no optimal candidate for radio mobilization as this patient suffers from relevant extra hepatic disease and we decided not to treat this patient. I want to show you some examples for angiography. This is very important. Um, the anatomy of the hepatic arteries is in most cases not as clear and not as easy as shown in the most books. Um, for example, in this case, the right hepatic artery is arising from the mesentery artery and here are some branches to the, the small, um, the, the, the stomach is there, the, the small um, duodenum or ileum as well. And you can see two large liver metastases in the right liver lobe, which we'd like to address. And you always have to keep in mind the anatomy of the hepatic arteries, because this is a strong indicator for, uh, for how careful you have to be during therapy to avoid side effects. A more common example with the main hepatic artery, the gastrodudinal artery supplying the duodenum and the pancreas. And like seen here, you have to coil this gastrodudinal artery to prevent any dystopic um, flow to, to the duodenum in the case of a backflow occurs. And secondly, you have here a small cystic artery which I would uh, recommend to coil as well, despite the risk of the patient developing an ischemic cholecystemia um, in this coil here, and after coiling these two dystopic arteries, then radiomization could be done safe in this position. We inject about 100 megapeperals of technetium MAA for liver lung shunting via the catheter, and it's important to inject in the same positions is designated for the radio mobilization in the left and right hepatic arteries separately. We should pre-treat the patient before application with perchlorate to avoid um, the gastric uptake of free technetium. It's quite common that a certain amount of technetium dissolves from the MAA and is free and um, we should would avoid these um, um, avoid these um, technetium to go into gastric in the, ga in the gaster because this would um, indicate this would lead you in the false direction and you would argue that there is a gastric uptake but it's mainly due to free technetium and therefore I would recommend to perform whole body centrifuge including the thyroid because if there is free technetium and the blockade with the perforate is not sufficient you will see uptake in the thyroid and then you know if there is uptake in the thyroid and in the stomach it's mainly due to free, to free technetium. And afterwards you quantify the liver lung shunting fraction by calculation of the geometric mean. <coughs> to show you some examples, we are forming a centigrade from the, from the front and from the back and afterwards we are performing Again, a stentigraphy from the front with a phantom with um, 57 cobalt, a gamma emitter, to delineate the contour of the patient and to be able to delineate the lungs more precisely. Then we draw regions of interest around the lung and around the liver and are able to quantify very precise the liver lung shunting fraction. In this patient, the liver lung shunt is about 4%, which is absolutely uh, okay, we can go ahead for randomization. This is another case. Uh, I think it's obvious on the first look that we have much activity within the lungs um, as compared to the liver. And indeed, in this patient, we had a, a shunting fraction of 30%. And as you can see on the right, with a liver lung shunting fraction of above 20%, um, no radiomobilization can be done. If the, radium, uh, if the liver lung shunting fraction is below 10%, it's no problem, you can go ahead as you have planned. 
preferable lung shunting fracture is between 10 and 15 percent, I would recommend a dose reduction of 20 percent. And if the lung shunting fraction is between 16 and 20 percent, should even reduce the dose more up to 40 percent. But not only the liver lung shunting fraction gives you an important information also, um, the SPEC and SPEC CT can give you very helpful information like in this patient. Um, you see the quite homogeneous uptake from the liver in this coronal slices. And in the transaxial slices, you can see this faint uptake within the, the cardia and in the distal esophagus. And in this case, radiolization could not be done due to a not correctable flow to the esophagus. We were not able to identify this small vessel supplying the esophagus in the risk of um, radiation-induced uh, toxicity of the esophagus was too high to perform radiolization. Another case, again, on coronary slice, you see the homogeneous uptake within the whole liver. On the first view, it looks quite normal. But if you go a little bit more into detail, in the transaxial slices, you can see this faint uptake in the ventral abdomen near the wall. And also in the coronal slices, you can see how it's this faint uptake, this linear uptake within the abdominal wall. And this is due to uh, uptake in the falciform artery. This is a phenomenon which we see quite often in about up to, I would just say, 3% of patients. Um, and we have to carefully um, take care about this phenomenon. Um, the falciform artery is mainly arising from the left hepatic artery and should be called even ever feasible. But we have even more information available using the MA scintigraphy and the SPECT and SPECT CT. We have um, an idea of the uptake of the tumor. If you look at this patient with a large central HCC and satellite lesions not clearly visible on this low dose CT and more uh, satellite lesions in the right and left liver level, um, you can appreciate that these tumors have a much higher uptake as compared to the normal liver lobe. And you can use this information to quantify the uptake of the tumors in the liver parenchyma and therefore calculate a kind of tumor to background ratio, which we need later on for um, dosimetric aspects. And from the logical point of view, the uptake of the tumors should be predictive for the achievable dose during radio mobilization within the tumor. And therefore, we would suggest that a high uptake should be uh, correlated with a good response. And I do not really know if this is true. Um, we have analyzed 26 patients with colangiocellular cellular carcinoma, and we found a little bit surprising to us that patients with a mean uptake in the MA scintigraphy, as indicated in the blue line, had a preferable outcome with a median survival which was not reached as compared to patients with a high uptake within the colonial cellular carcinoma as indicated in the green line, which had a median survival of 51 weeks. And I do not really have a complete ex uh, ex explanation for this phenomenon, but my suggestion is that patients with a high uptake and a high tumor vascularization um, have a more aggressive behavior and a more aggressive biology, and this aggressive biology um, outweighs the high achievable dose in these tumors. But this is just a hypothesis. Now I want to talk about the dosimetry and dosimetric aspects, and this is very important when you look at this slide. We know from external radiation therapy that normal liver parenchyma is at risk to develop radiation-induced liver disease when applying doses above 30 gray on the one hand. On the other hand, we know also from external beam radiation therapy that adenocarcinomas, for example, need curative doses of more than 70 gray. So this is kind of, um, kind of hard because on the one hand we have to achieve high doses but must stay below 30 grays in the normal liver parenchyma. If you go back to the slide, which I showed you with the microdosimetry of explanted livers, we know that we can achieve indeed in radio mobilization doses of much higher than 100 gray within the tumors, so we are able to solve this problem. We have different <coughs> models to calculate the 
um, the activity we want to apply to the patient. In former days, we used the Pyrrhic model, which was very plain, very simple. Um, the only parameter was the percentage liver involvement. If the liver involvement was below 25%, we used 2.0 gigabecquerels. If the liver involvement is higher, we used 2.5 gigabecquerels. Just want to show you this for historical reasons. It's the best to forget it right now because it's no longer um, recommended to use because you have a high risk of um, inducing radiation induced side effects within the liver with this very crude model. We have a more sophisticated model, the so-called PSA, body surface area method, which takes into account more information about the patient. Um, we take into account the body surface area, which is in strong correlation with the size of the liver. So we take the liver size into account, and we take into account, more precisely, the percentage liver involvement. So we are drawing regions of interest around the tumor, on every slice and around the whole liver and therefore can measure very precisely the percentage liver involvement and have a much more sophisticated idea of what dose we want to apply to the patient. I told you that the lung shunt is increased above 10%. You have to reduce the dose. In some centers also recommend to adopt the dose in patients exhibiting a very low or very high um, tumor involvement or in patients which are highly pretreated with different chemotherapies. And in my opinion, this is a very good idea and we do it like this. Um, I want to give you a few background information why to adopt. In patients with a very low tumor burden, only a comparably small percentage of spheres uh, is embolizing within the tumor and the most spheres are embolizing within the healthy liver tissue. And therefore, you have a comparably high radiation exposure to the healthy liver tissue and a higher risk, or a higher, not a higher risk, but a comparably higher risk to develop uh, toxicities when not adopting the dose. Just the opposite is true in patients with a very high um, tumor involvement of the liver. In these, these patients, the liver function is kind of balanced. They have quite low healthy liver tissue left, and this uh, healthy liver tissue is um, is able to to preserve the liver function, to preserve the, the to come to to to, to um, produce all the the albumin and the blood clotting. And if you harm these residual liver parenchyma too hard, um, then the function deteriorates, deteriorates, and then you have the situation that the patient uh, develops toxicity will. Uh, um, develop ascites, will develop hyperbilirubinemia, etc., etc. Therefore, often patients with very high uh, tumor disease, I would recommend to reduce the activity. And the same is true for heavily pretreated patients where the liver function is likely to be already harmed, and therefore you should adopt the, the activity as well. The BSA method is already quite sophisticated and this is indeed the method we will and I think you also uh, we use in, in the vast, vast majority of patients but in selected patients we have even a more sophisticated model the so-called partition model um, in this model we are calculating the radiation exposure to the normal liver parenchyma and the tumor separately and therefore we can increase those until the dose limiting organ has uh, reached its, its dose limit, but we need um, even more parameter, parameters to, to calculate this model. Um, we need, of course, the tumor, the tumor volume and the liver volume as per the PSA method, but we additionally need the uptake of the tumor on the MAA spec and the uptake of the normal liver parenchyma to calculate uh, the tumor to non-tumor ratio. And of course, we can all only calculate this ratio if the tumor can be localized in a discrete area and is visible on the MAA scintigraphy. Otherwise, we are not able to, to calculate the tumor to non tumor ratio. And we have, again, to make it even more complicated, three different possibilities to use the partition model. The first is the so called radio sigmatectomy which is a treatment where you only treat a very small part of the liver, like a segment. 
And of course, these kind of therapies are only useful when one liver segment is involved by the tumor first. And second, is only feasible when you can address these um, liver segments separately by one tumor feeding artery. And how it is done? You have a quite complicated formula where you have the calculated tumor dose, which we would suggest for 250 gray, which is not in this formula, not the dose, which the liver is limited, but the tumor dose. Then we have the tumor volume in this calculation. We have the liver volume, the liver lung shunting fraction, the tumor to liver ratio um, within the MA, spec acidity, and then um, we get the activity. If you calculate these formulas, <coughs> the whole liver volume and the whole tumor volume, you have of course to adjust the activity to the treated part of the liver. For example, if you treat one segment, you have to to divide it, uh, into, or you have to, to administer one eighth of the total activity as you are addressing only one eighth of the liver. And then you treat this artery and this segment um, until the total activity is administered or until stasis occurs because um, I told you there are billions of spheres and these spheres have an embolic effect and in some cases um, stasis occurs and you are not able to, to administer all the activity you have calculated. I want to share an example of this patient where we used this kind of segmentectomy. You have here the main branch of the hepatic artery and you see this artery feeding, what is he feeding this uh, kind of tumor? You can address um, these arteries separately in a more distinct way, and then you can see this kind of tumor blush on the cone beam CT with the arterial phase. You can also very clearly distinguish these um, contrast media uptake within the tumor. We injected the MAA only in this tumor feeding artery and see a very clear and sharp uptake of the MAA stratigraphy within this tumor. Calculated or dose and performed the radium mixation only, also only addressing this artery and we see a very concentrated <coughs> uptake within the tumor without involving the major majority of the liver. As second way, we have only a very simple formula, um, which I would recommend just to, to, to ensure that the activity you have calculated with this quite complicated formula is right. And you can, um, it is true that you achieve a dose of 50 gray if you administer one gigabetrol of Y19, one kilogram of tissue with a calculated tumor dose of 250 gray. So you can measure the tumor, um, let's say 200 grams, have one achieve a dose of 250 gray, and then you will get the, the activity you have to use to achieve this 250 gray. Very simple um, formula. I would suggest, suggest uh, that you use the more enhanced form. The third method in the partition model is if you want to treat the whole liver, but you want to use the partition model, which is only feasible if you have no disseminated disease, but uh, clearly delineable um, limited number of tumors, then you again use this formula but use now the dose, which is dose limiting to the liver, 30 gray, and again the tumor to non uh, tumor ratio, the mass of the tumor and the liver, the lung shunt and the correction factor, and then you will get the total amount of megabyte of Y90 spheres you have to use to achieve the maximum dose without harming the healthy liver too much. I want to show an example where um, Cetex uh, gave me this kind of preliminary version of a calculator which is quite easy to handle, um, which uses the partition model as well, um, where you can um, give all the, the numbers, the tumor volume, the liver volume, 
um, the uptake in the MAA scintigraphy in the lung and the liver, um, the maximum dose of the lung, 25 gray, the maximum dose of the normal liver, for example, 30 gray, and after by simply um, giving this calculator all these information, you will calculate uh, the maximum safe dose for uh, these patients, with, which is quite um, comfortable. But however, to my knowledge, it is not available at the moment, but it would be very desirable to have uh, this kind of calculator available. At least I want to, at last, I want to make you familiar with the, um, the advantage for using CSPHERES um, in quite common situation like in these. We have a right, right hepatic artery and we have th uh, two large metastases within the right liver lobe. And of course it would be favorable to address these two metastases separately and not to treat the whole right liver lobe. And there we have the, uh, um, the opportunity to calculate the dose for this tumor using the partition model, to calculate the dose for this tumor using the partition model, and then separating the dose in two vials using CIS spheres, and you, then you can address these two tumor feeding arteries separately with exactly those you have calculated, not more and not, not, not less. So, to conclude, I think I hope I've shown you that the symmetry in radiobilization is highly challenging. It's always has to be done on an individual basis. Each patient, patient is different. And it is even more difficult as post-treatment the symmetry is very difficult. Um, as I told you, Y90 is a pure beta emitter, so we can only use the brand strong for centigraphic measurements. And these Bremstrahl scintigraphies are very low quality, as you can appreciate here. And the symmetry based on these Bremstrahl scintigraphy is very, well, it's only a rough estimation in, best, in the best case, but it's not really a precise symmetry. So we have to base our symmetry on the pre-therapeutic MIA scintigraphy and do not have the opportunity to validate these uh, measurements with post-therapeutic scintigraphy. I want to close my talk with this picture, which I took at the ESA. It's kind of the Neil of Munich. Well, um, to be honest, it's much more smaller than the Nile. Um, but these are swans which are living on the ESA. And I've seen this with a goiter, I think. And it always remembers me that nuclear medicine is much about thyroid, but it's much more than thyroid. Thank you very much. <laughs>